And in fact, we are in a learning series right now called Building the Church of 2030. I cannot believe 2030 is closer than I think. It's closer than 1986 when I was born. Like, that's just crazy to me. But 2030 is right around the corner. So what we're doing in this learning series, for those of you who might be new, you're a returning guest, and you're not sure what building the church of 2030 is, this is a vision that God gave me in the middle of a message that we are not supposed to be a church who looks at year by year. God, what should we do this year? Now, we do that. We plan strategically year by year. But he also said, I want you to take decade by decade and plan out what I have for you in the future. Because God is not an annual God. Whew, Jesus. He's a God who's outside of time and space. He already knows what's going to happen in 2030. But he's given us this instruction to build the church of 2030. And so we're talking about our cultural values as a church And here's what I've been telling people, and I'm going to change my verbiage this morning, but for the first four weeks, I wanted to say it this way. You will know by the end of this message whether or not this is the church for you. And I want to give you permission to say, this ain't my church, I'm out. She's already leaving, Lord Jesus. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm playing, Jace. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. That was mean. I should have done that. I'm so sorry, Jace. She had a phone call. She had to go, y'all. Oh, Lord. What was I saying? Anyway, yes, you'll know by the end of this message, and we really do. We, we want you to find the church where you're going to grow spiritually, and so if this is not the church for you, if we aren't your cup of tea, that's fine. Let us know. We're connected to other churches. We want to get you connected to a home church so that you can grow spiritually. However, I also want to say it this way. By the end of this message, you might just be saying, this ain't my church because of what I'm about to say to you today. But it might be your pride getting in the way. So I'm going to ask you to stick with me through this entire series. Instead of just deciding, I'm out of here. I'm asking you, stick with me through all, yes, 12 weeks of this series. And listen closely to what God is pouring out for our church for the future. I believe that God has called us to be the church of 2030. So here's what we've done so far. First four weeks is this. Number one, we are all about the real Jesus. That means we don't do self-guided spirituality. We don't make the choice of what we want. We surrender to the real Jesus of the Bible, full of grace and truth. Week two, we said this, the mission to introduce real people to the real Jesus, it's bigger than me. So I can't live small when the mission is this big. In week three, we said this, we are not owners. I'm sorry, we are owners, not members. We own the faith of this house. We own the family of this house, and we own the finances of this house. What does that mean? It means we invest, we don't pay a fee. Week four, last week we said this, we surrender to the stretch. We allow God to stretch our capacity for the most of what he has for us. Somebody say amen. Amen. Today, I want you to pull out your Bibles. Go ahead, pull out a Bible, digital or physical, leather bound or otherwise. (laughs) Tap on your app, tap that app, open that Bible. And I want you to go to two places today with me, Hebrews chapter 11 and Luke chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 11 and Luke chapter 7. If you're online, it'll be on your screen as well, but I want to encourage you, get a Bible. Why get a Bible if it's going to be on my screen? Because you don't know what God's going to speak to you. I've been in services sometimes where the pastor's talking about this point in the passage, and God is like, I need you, Stephen, to keep reading because I've got something more for you than what he's saying. And you might need to be in your Bible today. So Hebrews chapter 11 and Luke chapter 7. Today, I want to share with you our fifth cultural value, which is this. We live in in Jesus amazed faith. We live in Jesus amazed faith. Somebody say, I have have Jesus amazed faith. faith. I'm going to share with you what this means, but again, I want to just reciprocate this, and I want to repeat this over and over because this is a back and forth. Our mission is to introduce real people to the real Jesus. Our vision is to build and to be the church of 2030. And to do those two things requires that we live in Jesus' amazed faith. Did you know everybody has faith? You have faith today. 
Even if you're one of those people who lives in fear, did you know what fear is? I had to re- reshift this narrative in my mind of what fear is because I, I, there was this narrative for the last two years, um, faith over fear, faith over fear, faith over fear. But in reality, did you know that fear is actually faith? I'm gonna show you this from scripture. Fear is actually faith. Fear is simply faith in the negative or faith in the void where God does not exist It's creating a narrative of the worst case scenario. And it's believing that. I'm not talking about the emotion of fear. Somebody pops out and goes, boo! I mean, yeah, I'm afraid. I'm literally talking about you have decided in your mind of what is going to happen in your life, what's going to happen in your future. That's putting faith in something that God did not speak over you. That's what fear is. Let me show you this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. I'm going to be in the New King James and then the Amplify. But here's what New King James says. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 98% of the things we're afraid of have not even happened yet. You can't see the results of them yet. But you're hoping that they do, and so you act like they will, and that's what fear is. It's faith in the void or the absence of God. Here's what Hebrews 11.1 says in the Amplified. Faith is the assurance. It's the title deed or the confirmation of things hoped for or divinely guaranteed. It's the evidence of things not seen. I love this. It's the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what can't be experienced by the physical senses. Again, the negative side of faith, the negative attribute of faith is if you put your faith in a place where God is not, you will buy the lie that that thing will happen. That's called fear. He says it's the title deed or the confirmation. Faith is simply the currency of heaven. Faith is how you purchase things. It's how you bring heaven to earth. It's how you bring Jesus into your life. It's the simple solution to salvation. Faith is simply the currency. God, I want to buy salvation. I want to be forgiven of my sins. He says, put your faith in Jesus. Faith is simply the currency by which God exchanges what he has for what we need. It's the title deed or the confirmation. One of the greatest moments in my life was paying off our house. I'll never forget the phone call of telling this man. And I felt bad for this man because he's just, you know, he's just a loan officer or whatever. You know, he's just processing my, my last payment. But I just, I mean, I wanted to cuss him out. I wanted to just rub it in his face. I ain't never going to talk to you again, sucker. You suck. I hate you. I hate mortgage company. And like, he, he, I didn't do that. That's what I wanted to do. I'm mad at him because he's taking this last payment, but I'm also really, really excited. But I remember in the mail, um, they sent this letter, and we got a copy of our, the deed to our home. And no longer is Wells Fargo on that deed. Amen. The title deed of our house says Stephen and Susanna Kilgore. Don't nobody own my house. Nobody can touch it. They can't, the government can't take it. Why? Because I paid for it. I own it. It is mine. I get to do what I want with it now. Faith does the same thing. Faith purchases the title deed of things that you are believing God for. It's like having the title deed to joy in your back pocket, having the title deed to prosperity in your back pocket, just walking around with it, waving it around, and just saying, I own this now. Why? Because I have faith, and God comes through faithfully. But a few verses later, we read this in Hebrews 11, 6. It says, without faith. It's impossible to please God because he who comes to God must believe that God is or that he exists and, somebody say and, yeah. y'all are quiet today, so I'm going to have to get you to repeat after me, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So faith at its most basic level is I can believe that God exists, and I can believe that God is a rewarder of those that diligently, somebody say diligently, diligently seek him. What does diligent mean? Diligently mean. Diligently means that no matter the circumstance, no matter what the news says, no matter what the doctor says, I continue to seek out what I have requested of God because he has been faithful in the past. He will be faithful again, and what I have asked from him in faith will be done for me. That's what diligently means. 
It means even when my answer is postponed, I keep seeking after God by faith. I keep trusting God by faith. Some of y'all need to get more excited. The reason your life sucks is because you don't have this message right here in your heart. You're not receiving from God because you don't diligently seek after him. He said he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. Anybody who has faith to believe that God is real has a faith that pleases God. Now, I take no issue with faith that pleases God. We all need faith that pleases God. We need to believe that God is. We need to believe that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But I want to talk to you about a level and a measure of faith today that I've never heard preached before except for one time, well, two times, one from somebody else and one time here. I want to talk to you about Jesus' amazed faith. Somebody say, I have have Jesus' amazed faith. The reality is, is you can walk and live in safe faith, or you can walk and live in Jesus' amazed faith. You can walk and live in safe faith, comfortable faith, come to church every Sunday faith, find my same seat that I'm comfortable in faith, sing the songs that I like at church faith, tithe consistently faith. Raise my kids, retire, and die, faith. Or you can have Jesus' amazed faith, a dangerous faith. The Bible talks about Jesus being amazed in two places in Scripture. But the characteristic of God tells me that it should be impossible for God to be amazed. Jesus was God in flesh. Now, the Bible says he removed his godly side, became completely human, but he's also God at the same time. I don't understand it. Please don't ask me questions on it. I don't want to debate you theologically. I don't understand it. No one ever will. Probably even when we get to heaven, we won't understand that. But this is who Jesus was. He was God in flesh on the earth. He removed his heavenly self, and he became this human being full of God and full of humanity just to be here with us. But while he is here, he is so filled with the Holy Spirit that he knows things. He sees things. Like crazy miracles happen when Jesus goes places. There are characteristics of God in Scripture, one of them being he is omnipotent. It means he's all-powerful. God can do whatever he wants. He's holy. Everything he does is perfect. Even if you disagree, he's still holy. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Another one is he's omniscient. He knows all things. Another one is he's omnipresent. He is present at all times in all all places. So to amaze God, a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present should be impossible. But here's what the Bible records. It records that Jesus was amazed twice in his life. The first is in Mark chapter 6. I want to show you this in verses 5 and 6. It says, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Let me explain what's happening here. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus goes to his hometown of Capernaum. He stands up in the synagogue. He reads from the, the scroll of Isaiah, a prophecy about him. And he says, this is the person you're talking about. I am he. I have come to fulfill this prophetic vision that Isaiah had. Well, because he's in his hometown, he has a lot of people who had changed his diapers over the years. He has people who has known him through his teenage years. Uh, His brothers and sisters are there. His mom is there. He's got family members there, aunts and uncles and cousins and stuff. They're there in the synagogue, and they hear Jesus say that he is the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah, and they start getting offended at him. They get so offended at him that eventually they try to kill him, not on the cross. I'm talking about they try to throw him off a cliff. But here's what it says. It says Jesus was so amazed at what? Their lack of faith. Their lack of faith. He was amazed at the fact that they didn't have faith. He thought, y'all have known me my whole life. I've been perfect. And now I stand here and I tell you who I am and you have a lack of faith? I'm just curious. I'm not saying this is anybody in the house today or watching online, but could Jesus be amazed at you because of your lack of faith right now? If you could sum up the last two years of your life, I just go for two years because I feel like the pandemic reset everything, but the last two years of your life, would Jesus be amazed at your lack of faith? You don't have to answer that. (laughs) In fact, don't answer that. The other instance of Jesus being amazed, though, was this in Luke chapter 7. 
And this is where I want to go today. This is where I want to focus today. So, Father, do your work in this house. Somebody say amen. Amen. Starting in verse 1, Luke chapter 7. When Jesus had finished saying all this, if you want to know what he said, go read Luke chapter 6. When he said all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. I want you to notice this is the same town. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion just heard of Jesus. He sent some elders of the Jews to to Jesus, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, or we could say it this way, diligently with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He wasn't far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, you know what, Lord, don't trouble yourself. I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. This is why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority. I've got soldiers under me. I tell one of them, go, and he goes. I tell this one, come here, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. So he turned to the crowd following him, and this was offensive. He says, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant completely well. Father, I pray that this word would permeate that outer barrier of our faith that is so hesitant to allow you to move in our lives. And I pray that today there would be a breaking of chains in Jesus' name, that our faith would come alive and we would begin to walk and live in Jesus' amazed faith. If you receive that, say amen. Amen. In Luke chapter 7, this is a very interesting story. Again, Jesus is in his hometown of Capernaum. And there, he meets a centurion, a Roman centurion. centurion. At this time, the Israelite nation was under Roman rule. The Romans, that's back when the Roman Empire was being built incredibly fast. They were taking over all of the Middle East, all of Europe. And the centurion, who is a leader of 100 soldiers, hence the name centurion, he has a servant whom he loves who is his right-hand man, is probably the chief of all his other servants, but he has invested in this person. He cares for this person, and now this person is dying. And he sends the elders of the Jews, the Pharisees or the teachers of the law, those who have some kind of pull in the religious realms, and he says, go see Jesus because I've heard about this guy. He doesn't really know this guy yet, but he's he just heard about him. The guy can do miracles. I've heard this, like pretty cool miracles. See if he's willing to come to my house to lay hands on and pray over this servant so that he can be healed. So the elders go to him. They say, we'll, we'll, we'll figure this out. And I want you to see this dynamic because the elders go with a predication of This Roman centurion has done a lot of good things, and he deserves to have you heal this young man. Now, this isn't in my notes, but I just feel like someone needs to hear this. When you go to God with your good works, the Bible says they're as filthy as rags. If you're trying to seek an answer from God or a miracle from God based on your good works, your good works do not compare to the holiness and the good works of God. So you never should feel like you have to adapt or list out what you have done to get God to do something for you. That's not the God we serve. We serve a God of grace. The centurion didn't say, go tell him all I've done. That was on the Jews. They thought they knew how to get Jesus to show up. But in the middle of this, as Jesus goes, okay, all right, all right. And I love, too, it says they had to diligently or earnestly tell this to Jesus, which means to me Jesus is going, I don't need to hear this. This has nothing to do with me. What are you talking about? Why, why are you trying to, like, entice me into doing this? Like, I would just do it if you just ask. They weren't asking. They were demanding because of what this man's good works had done. Do you hear what I'm saying? Is this is making sense to you? Okay. And this is what people do, so I want to correct this in you. In the middle of this, though, 
he sends some other people and he says, Jesus, look, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. I knew I didn't deserve to even see you face to face. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. Because I'm a man of authority and I'm a man under authority. I have servants who when I say go, they go. I have people when I say come, they come. I say do this, they don't hesitate. They do it immediately and with a good attitude. Oh, I love people like that. <laughs> and Jesus is amazed at this man's faith. He says, I haven't even found such great faith in all of Israel. Jesus just put down his entire people, <laughs> past, present, and future. <laughs> he said, I, even in the Israelites, those of you who are supposed to believe in me, I haven't ha ha found such great faith. That's, I mean, Jesus was a G, like rolling around, just insulting people, like whatever, walks off. But what was it that was so amazing about this man's request? Well, you have to understand, if you go read through your Bible, you go read through the miracles of Jesus, up until this point right here, there was a process to get healed. There was a very specific outline of events that had to happen in order for healing to manifest. The process was this. Number one, you get sick. Because otherwise, what's the point? You have to get sick. Number two is, you have to get Jesus to show up physically wherever the sick person is. So that means either I have to travel to him, or he has to travel to me. But Jesus must be physically present in order for healing to manifest. Number three, Jesus gotta take them, he's got to take the miracle work in hands and put it on the person. And number four, he has to say something to get the sickness and the diseases and the devils and all that to leave. Now, this is what the centurion had, what? Heard. Up until this point, this is what he'd heard. You got somebody who's sick? Get Jesus to come to them or bring them to him. Make sure if Jesus doesn't put the hands on them, the hands are, this is where it's at right here. Woo! If the hands aren't on the person, nothing happens. They got to put the hands on. And he's got to speak the words. Be healed. Devil come out. Whatever it is, he's got to put the hands on, speak the words. Then you'll see healing. This is how it works. Everybody understand? This is the process. Yes. Centurion is sitting in his house, and he's thinking of his position. He's going, now hold up. This dude's been rolling around healing people. I can't heal people. I can send people to sick people. I can send them with medicine, but it may not work. This dude has some crazy power. I mean, some crazy power. So why is it that Jesus has to show up physically in my house in order to heal my servant? Because when I want something done, because I'm running this place, I tell somebody to do it, and they do it. When I want something done, when I want somebody to come visit me, I send a servant, and they tell that person, come to his house. And they don't go, I've got too much going on. They show up. Why? Because I have the power and the authority to make it happen. I speak words, and things happen. So why is it that Jesus has to show up physically in the house? Why is it he's got to put his hands on somebody? Why is it he's got to pray the prayer, and then they get healed? Why can't we just skip to the last step? Because it'd be so much easier and it saves so much time if I could just get Jesus to say, be healed wherever he is. Because I know wherever I am, I can be in bed in the middle of the night and I wake up for just a quick glance and I go, I want some chocolate milk. And by God, 45 seconds later, my servant shows up with chocolate milk. Because there's always someone under my authority listening to my words. So he tells his friends, just go tell Jesus, look, you take a vacation wherever you're at. I'll buy your lunch. You want some beignets? Get some beignets. You want some croissants? I'll get some croissants. It's good. Just have a snack or something. Just chill. But after you're done eating, I'll pay for it all. You just chill out for a little bit. And then you know what? If you could just say the words that my servant would be healed, I believe he'll be healed. <gasps> Jesus is like, what? <laughs> what? Y'all look at somebody with your most shocked face. Like, think of the most shocked face thing you can think of. 
Why are you giving your husband side eye, ladies? Don't do that. I said shocked face. There's a difference. That's not your shocked face. That's your side eye, like they did something wrong. Like you just, what? What? Oh my gosh. Jesus is, the word amazed literally means to be caught off guard, to be stopped in his tracks, to be shocked by what had just been said. Why was Jesus shocked? Because up until that point, everyone had a traditionalistic faith that said that Jesus had to show up at the house, be interrupted in his day, put his hands on the person. Not, putting your hands on sick people, that is not appealing to me. I mean, can I just be honest with you? God bless nurses and doctors who just show up. When I walk into my doctor and I'm sick, and I just, I mean, this is pre-COVID days especially, they didn't have masks on or anything like that, and I'm sitting there and I'm just thinking, how often do you get sick? Because I'm sitting there breathing in your face, and I've just got a sinus infection. The person before me had all kinds of SARS and syphilises and stuff, and you just like, I'm like, how in the world, how do you not get sick? They're going to risk Jesus' life because somebody dying of some weird disease they don't understand. We don't know. This could have been COVID. You don't know. Jesus, come show up. Put your hands on the person. Jesus is like, y'all, I need my Purell real quick. Hold up. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. But he says, you don't have to show up. You just speak the word. Say the word over my servant, and he will be healed. Jesus is shocked by this. Why? It wasn't because he had skipped to the last point of the process, it's because he had spoken from a place of authority. He understood that when Jesus speaks, every demon in hell, every sickness and every disease must do what Jesus says. And not anybody even in Israel had figured that thing out. Why? Because the Israelites were a nation of laws and decrees, processes and systems. And their belief was you had to do things from step A to step Z in order to get God to grant you what you want. But some Gentile heathen, some warrior, some military man who had slaughtered the masses, who had blood on his hands, who was taking over God's chosen nation, dared to say, Jesus just Speak the word? Jesus is like, are y'all listening to this? Because you'd save me a bunch of time if you would stop trying to trail me everywhere I went to get me to do what you want. I just got to speak the word. And he's amazed at this man's faith. He said, I haven't even seen such great faith in all of Israel. And he wasn't wrong. The centurion said this, for power to operate, it does not require physical presence. For power to operate, it does not require physical presence. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Faith that leaves Jesus amazed is faith that believes that God will do the things that no one knew he could, he would, or he should do. Faith that leaves Jesus amazed is faith that believes that God will do the things that no one knew he could, he would, or he should do. Faith that leaves Jesus shocked and stopped in his tracks is faith that believes that God will do the things. God's about to do the things. God has done the things that no one knew he could, he would, or he should do. It's not a faith, a traditionalist faith that says, I have to have a process, and I've got to work this hard, and I've got to meet this criteria, and meet these re requirements by this date, or else God won't do it. No, it's a faith that says, Jesus, speak over me. Say what you want in my life. God, whatever you want, I want. Just speak the word. Man, that broke open the whole system of healing. That's why folks would be like, Pastor, will you pray for me? No. First of all, you coughing all over me, asking me to pray. Can you pray with me? No. Why do I need to pray for you? 
well, because I went to this doctor and this doctor and this doctor and this doctor and this person prayed for me, this person prayed for me, this person prayed for me, this person prayed for me. Okay, so if you went to this doctor, this doctor, this doctor, this, you, this person prayed for you, this person prayed for you. You called Benny Hinn, had him pray for you. You called Joel Osteen, had him pray for you. Somehow you got a hold of all these dudes, Bishop Jakes, you prayed for them. And now you're coming to me as the last resort. Number one, you got your whole region mixed up. <laughs> I should have been number one on your list, but different story. What that tells me is it's not a position of everyone else has the problem. There's something internally here. I need to get my faith checked out. I need to get my faith worked on. I've got to get some thoughts and some processes and some things out of my head, out of my heart for Jesus to be amazed at my faith. If Jesus is omniscient. If Jesus had the Holy Spirit and he knew all things, if Jesus knew that this was an option, why didn't Jesus just go around telling people, I don't need to go there. I can just say the word. Why didn't Jesus give them a clue? I love this. John Wesley said it this way. Without God, man cannot. Without man, God will not. God will never force anything on you that he knows is an option. God will not force anything on you that he knows is an option. Why? Because God operates on the basis of our faith. He could if he wanted to. Listen to me. He is God. Never forget this. He is God. He could literally flick his pinky and all of us would burn alive. He could take us out, wipe us out. That's not what he does. He chooses to operate on the earth because of our asking and our imagination and our curiosity and our hunger, our Jesus amazed faith. He does what he does on the earth because he trusts us to have faith for these things. You want to see heaven on earth? You have to have Jesus amazed faith. But many times there's a gap between what we believe and what God can do. We've We've been taught that having faith means that you can get a miracle. But have you ever been taught that God trusts you to be included in the process of how that miracle comes about? We've been taught, just believe, just believe, just believe, just believe, for the miracle, for the miracle, for the miracle. But have you ever been taught that God may trust you because of your faith to be included in the process of how the miracle shows up in the first place? That's what this man did. Jesus' amazed faith is believing that God will do the things that no one knew he could, he would, or he should do. Now, last time I preached this message, I stopped right there. Shut the book. I was done. And y'all are draining me today because you look so tired. But I want to simplify it even more. If you want to operate in Jesus' amazed faith, you have to believe in the power of three things. Somebody say three. three. Number one is you have to believe in the power of the grace of God. You have to believe in the power of the grace of God. What did the centurion say when, he show, or when his friend showed up? He said, I want you to speak this to him. I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. I don't even deserve to see you in person. That's grace right there. You're about to get something you don't deserve. That's great. That's the grace of God. Do you know you don't deserve to be healed? You deserve to die a horrible death. Why? Because compared to a holy God, you are filthy. I'm filthy. I'm a heathen. I will never match up to the greatness and the holiness and the purity of our God. And when I sin against a holy, amazing God, I deserve the worst kind of punishment. But by his grace, I stand here today. But by his grace, I am forgiven. But by his grace, I am made whole. You don't deserve to live the life you're in. Stop complaining about your life because you don't even deserve the life you got. You don't deserve to wake up in the morning. You don't deserve the breath in your lungs by God's standards, but because of his grace. You have to believe in the power of the grace of God. You don't deserve miracles. You don't deserve anything from God. I don't deserve to be able to come into the presence of God and go, God, I need a miracle. I don't deserve to be able to ask God for miracles of healing, miracles of provision, but because of his grace, his great love for us, even though I don't deserve it, he still says you have access to it. The Bible says this, come boldly into the throne room, not of God, but the throne room of grace. 
When you're a follower of Jesus, you can not, not, knock on the throne room of grace, get access to the Father in heaven through Jesus, and ask him for what you will in the name of Jesus. That's grace. Y'all are too quiet for me. Lord, send me more black folks in the name of Jesus. If you got offended by that, good. And send me the wild and out Hispanics. Not the Presbyterian ones, God. Give me the wild and out. Oh, Jesus. In glory adios. Give me those, God. You laugh. I'm serious. Now watch this start happening. All the white folks are going to be offended. That's fine. You have to believe in the power of the grace of God. Grace is what manifests his miracles at the foundational level. Grace is what gives us access to healing. Grace is what gives us access to salvation. Grace is what gives us access to forgiveness. Grace is what gives us a sound mind and a sound heart. Grace is what gives us faith in general. Just God's grace is so amazing when you think about how wild you are. But you got to believe, if you want to have Jesus amazed faith, you got to know you don't deserve to get what you're about to ask for God. What does that do? It rearranges the hierarchy of my life. I don't deserve this in the first place. God, I don't deserve anything from you but by your grace. Number two is you have to believe in the power of the word of God, of the word of God. He said, just say the word and my servant will just say the word. There have been times in my life where I have not known what to do. And I'm telling you, I've, because I know this is where all pastors go. You got the word of God at your, at your hands all the time. You need to know the word of God. I understand that. I understand that. I believe in that. Listen to me. Foundational? Yes. You need to know what the word of God says. This is just as powerful as Jesus speaking over you. But there are times, y'all, where I have been through a situation I love this book. I've studied it backward and forward. I read through it every year now. I love it. I love studying it. But there are some times where there's things going on in my life where I cannot find the right passage of Scripture. Google can't, Google can't help me find it. Kids a mess. Children a mess. Marriage a mess. Finances a mess. You ever been there? Everything's just out of whack. And you want to stand on one Scripture, but you're like, God, that's just not... That's not exactly the culmination of everything that I'm trying to get to, and you don't really have an answer for what's happening. And again, I'm not saying the Bible is not authoritative here. I'm just helping you understand. There are times where just trying to find something in the Bible, you don't got time for that. You don't know how to figure it out. Google can't get it for you. Here's what I've done. I've done this. Jesus I just pray that you would speak over this situation. I don't know what word I'm looking for, but Jesus, you do. And the Bible says you're my intercessor. So I just pray you would stand before the throne room of God right now. You'd stand in the Father's face and you say, Jesus, uh, you say, Father, Stephen needs this. And you begin to speak that over me, whatever it is, because I don't know. I'm losing my mind trying to figure out what's wrong. But God, you know all things. So Jesus, pray over me. Speak over me. Speak over my children. Speak over my marriage. Speak over my finances. Speak over my church, God. Speak over my city. Speak over my nation. There's some times where you don't have the words. The Holy Ghost ain't got the words for you. You got to go straight to the Son of God and say, Jesus, you speak over me. When you understand the power that that holds, when Jesus is talking to the Father on your behalf, that's grace. But the same word where he, let me go back to this. Before I say this, I got to be careful. I am correct. Then that must mean that was the Holy Spirit. Go back to Luke chapter 7. Derek, you don't have to put this on the screen. If you're watching online, if you're here in person, go back to Luke chapter 7. Verse 6, it says, Lord, don't trouble yourself. For I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go and he goes and that one, come and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And he turned the 
to the crowd following him. And he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Where did Jesus speak that the servant should be healed in that passage? Nowhere. When you understand the power of Jesus, simply you have the faith in the word of God. Sometimes Jesus doesn't even have to say nothing. Your faith just begins to manifest some things. God begins to move. Jesus was so amazed he forgot to pray over the dude and the dude still got healed. I want Jesus to forget what he was in the middle of and go, I forgot to even pray about this, but God, you are, Father, you did this, why? Because his faith amazed me so much, I had to do something for Stephen. He said, Jesus, I trust you, I know, speak over me. Man, that's some good faith right there. Jesus didn't even have to say nothing. They just showed back up. Oh, you better? I almost think, like, if I'm that person, I'm thinking that these servants are going back expecting to find him dead. Why? Because Jesus forgot to pray. Can you amaze Jesus so much that he forgets to speak what you asked him to spoke, speak over you? But that's amazed faith. You have to have faith in the power of the word of God. The word will manifest even without him saying it. Why? Because your faith has just stopped him. He has to move. But it's not because you deserve it. I got to clarify that again. Because there's an ugly message out there. You can demand things from God. He has to do it because his words. No, he doesn't. He doesn't do nothing he doesn't want to. He chooses to be in covenant with us by faith. A holy God, because of his grace, says, just ask me for it. The last thing, though, is this. You have to believe in the power of the authority of God. Not just in the grace of God, not just in the word of God, but in the authority. There is power in the authority of God. These are two separate things, but they manifest accordingly. Police officers have authority. When they have the red lights on center and Pioneer go out, and the police officers are out there, and sometimes I wish I could just like go hug them. I feel so bad for police officers when traffic lights go out, because that's the worst thing. Police officers have to do sit out in the heat or the freezing cold and direct people who are mad because you have to go one car at a time. Be respectful, y'all. Just be respectful. They have the authority. Stop. Come on. Stop. <laughs> you slow down. You're going to stop. You're going to stop. You're going to stop. Stop. Okay. You turn left. Turn left. <laughs> Ma'am, get off your phone and turn left. Turn, turn. Don't interrupt me. Stop. Turn left. Turn left. All right, y'all, stop. All right, now you come. Come. Now you come. You both y'all come. You stop, you stop. You both come. I'm an observant fellow, by the way. I could do this. I can't do nothing else. Don't send me to a murder scene, but I'll do that. I'll do traffic all day. They have the authority. But you know what happens if somebody chooses not to stop? Splat. That cop don't have the power to stop a car. He can pull out his gun all he wants. Ain't gonna stop the car. He can plant his feet down. Stop. Ain't gonna stop the car. Why? He has absolutely zero power to stop a car. But he has authority to stop a car. God has both authority and power. And his authority releases his power. Now I'm about to take you to a real deep level. The reason why Jesus was amazed with this man is because the man brought up the word authority. Say it like you mean it, authority. authority. Oh, my gosh. Some of the parents are like, yes, I need that back in my house, authority. <laughs> Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> authority. That's a, mm, I like that word. 
means I tell this one to go and he goes, and this one come and he comes. I tell this one do this and he does it. He said, authority. Why was Jesus amazed at this man's faith? Because this man was not a follower of Jesus. He had just heard of Jesus. And yet, he had received either by word or by deed of Jesus. He had received, I believe under the influence of the Holy Spirit, a revelation of something that Jesus would eventually tell his followers Behold, I give you authority to cast out devils, trample on serpents. You will drink poison. It won't harm you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, tribe, and tongue. Baptize folks in the name of Jesus. He said, I gave them authority, but this centurion received the authority of God before Jesus even told his followers about it. Because he was a man of authority, he understood authority. And he took authority. And he sent his servants. And he said, you tell Jesus, you ain't got to show up. Just speak the word. God has both power and authority. But here's what the Bible says. He didn't give you his Power, but he did give you his authority, and his authority opens the door to his power. Are you tracking with me? You don't have power in and of yourself, but you do have authority. So here's what that means. It means that when you understand the power behind the authority of Jesus Christ, of the name of Jesus, of the word of Jesus, you don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to be confused anymore. You don't have to be addicted anymore. You don't have to be derelict anymore. You don't have to be disabled in your life anymore. You don't have to have mental health issues anymore. Now, I know it's easy for me to say this, but some people it's hard to receive this. It takes time to really understand this and live this out. Faith is like a muscle. You got to work it a little bit. You got to get it to grow a little bit. Here's my advice to you. Start with the sniffles, work your way up to cancer. Go down to the pediatrician, find all them kids with runny noses. In the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Don't just work your way up to cancer patients. No, leave that for the big dogs who got real Jesus amazed faith. But what I'm trying to get you to understand is you got to start somewhere. And the first place you got to start is the understanding God has given you his authority. And the devil has to come under that authority. And your marriage has to come under that authority. And your children have to come under that. I'm speaking to you. Your children have to come under that authority. In the name of Jesus. But you don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. You didn't do nothing to earn it. You don't deserve it. Filthy you. Dirty you. Nasty me. You don't deserve that. Why do I keep going back to that point? You don't. And when you lose sight of that, you manipulate and you pervert what I'm trying to teach today. Not my will, but your will, Father, be done. You don't deserve it. So before you start asking God for the car of your dreams, ask him, God, is it your will in the name of Jesus, that I take on this $800 a month car payment that I can't afford? Before you start using your Jesus amazed faith to Ronda Shonda, tie my bow tie, coming in a Toyota, leave it in a Honda, <laughs> start trying to use the authority of God to get that person to marry you because you're tired of being a booty call, ask God. I know I don't deserve, I don't deserve a spouse. I don't deserve a spouse. I don't deserve to have somebody love me as much as my wife loves me. I don't deserve that. She doesn't deserve it either. Y'all, I give her so, too much love. <laughs> Ask yourself, God, is it your will that I tie my soul to this person and tie my life to this? Is this what, is this the best that you have for me? Because when you understand that you don't deserve 
what you're about to ask God for, what you will do is you will look to God and go, God, because I don't deserve this, I don't want to ask for it just on my own basis. I want to ask for what you want for me. I don't know if I can say it again because I don't remember. Let me rewind. Because I know that I don't deserve what I'm about to ask you for in the first place, let me check with you first and make sure that what I'm about to ask for is what you will for my life. Because if I'm at this level, and, and, and as a human being, I will ask for things that will mess up my life real quick. I don't want to just even attempt to manipulate my faith to get something from you. Because here's the problem. I'm going deep today. I don't have time. What is this? Listen to me. Um, did you know that the devil can hear your prayers? He can hear what you pray. He's no, he's no dummy. And there are times where you will pray things in faith, in the name of Jesus, and the devil will make sure that you get exactly what you prayed for. And he'll give all the credit to God, and your life will be tore up from the floor up. And you'll start blaming God, and you'll blame, I'm just hurt by the church. No, you weren't. No, you weren't. You were hurt by your own prayers. Pastor told me out. Pastor told you what you needed to hear. I'm not saying that's everybody's story, but here, let me tell you something. I don't always do it right, but when I do it, it's because I want you to hear what God has for your life. If I'm not here tomorrow, I want to know that the words I spoke over you were words that Jesus would speak over you. I want the Holy Spirit to speak through me every time. But the devil's listening to you. And when you're like, ooh, in the name of Jesus, let me use myself as an example because y'all get mad at me. Listen to me. Lord, I think in the name of Jesus, I'm going to drive a BMW X5. That's my dream car. That's what I want. I want a BMW X5. Why aren't y'all taking notes? What are y'all doing? You told us this. Come on. Just take notes anyway. I need you. I want it decked out. The main thing I want is heated seats and a heated steering wheel. Y'all, that's really just it. That's it. What color? Blue. Thank you for asking, sir. I appreciate it. That's a real friend right there. There's a, there's a BMW blue. It's a special blue that they do. Okay, it's that navy blue type. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Lord, bless the work of his hands in Jesus' name. <laughs> God. Woo! Woo! Just let me take a second. Let me anoint him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> here's, here's what I'll do. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. Is right now in, in American history, uh, everything is more expensive. And... I have people who I love who have gone out and, and because their used car was worth more than it was two years ago, they went and got a better car and they got a payment they couldn't afford in Jesus' amazed faith. And it's really tempting to go, God, if you did it for them, you'll do it for me. <laughs> but I got to ask myself, did God do that for them? Or did they do that for them and they're trying to give God credit until it gets repoed? That's a practical example. So I have to be careful going, in the name of Jesus, I think I'm going to drive a BMW X5. Because I could go out tomorrow and buy one. I could easily go buy one. But I can't pay cash for one. And I can't live debt free if I did that. So what do I do? I go back to the will of God. And I go back to what the word of God says. And I go back to the promise that he gave me that you and your wife will never go back into debt. And I go back to the borrower is slave to the lender. And I go back and I sit there and I trust in him. Listen, you're in debt. Don't, don't fret. Don't get mad at me. Listen to me. God will provide what you need to get out and stay out of debt. I'm a living testament to that. But I got to be careful praying that prayer because the devil will be like, this is not a joke. If you don't think the devil owns social media, because every time I say something, watch this, watch this. Donuts, 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 donuts. You give it two hours, my Instagram feed will be filled with donuts. I have preached a message before, and I'll get in my car and get on Instagram, and immediately things that I was saying in the sermon showed up on my Instagram feed. 
Now, I'm not saying the devil really owns it. He might. I don't know. But, <laughs> but he's listening. Jesus' amazed faith is believing that God's going to do the things that no one knew he could, he would, or he should do. It means you have authority to get in on the process and trust God to do the things that no one knew he could, he would, or he should do. It means that healing that the doctor says requires three surgeries and three years of recovery, God can do in an instant. Why? Or he can do holistically. Why? Because you've got faith and you're asking and trusting God in his word and his authority and his grace. You don't deserve. It means that weight loss that you've been struggling with, God, y'all, God knows our bodies. And if we act in righteous faith and we just do the thing that we know we're supposed to do, I'm going to tell you right now, I believe God can cause fat cells to deplete quicker. I believe God can clean out our arteries faster than a surgery. I believe he can do some things. We got to believe that God can do the things no one knew he could, he would, or he should do. That's Jesus of amazed faith. Our mission is to introduce real people to the real Jesus. Our vision is to build the church of 2030, but that requires that every single person who says, I own that mission and that vision, it means that we have Jesus amazed faith. So when God begins to move in your life, begins to challenge your small, pleasing faith, don't run from it, step into it. Because God's going to do the things that no one knew he could, he would, or he should do.